Hi, and welcome to Human Remains, also known as Forensic Anthropology. Forensic Anthropology is a type of applied anthropology that specializes in the changes and variations in the human skeleton for the purpose of legal inquiry. So a forensic anthropologist may provide basic identification information on skeletonized or badly decomposed remains. So. A couple years ago, there were some skeletal remains that were found inside a drainage ditch near the I-17 downtown. Those were sent to a forensic anthropologist for them to look at uh, and evaluate what gender they were, what their age range was, if they could estimate a race uh, about how tall they were, and if they had any death, disease, or anomaly. So. Sometimes uh, from a whole bone, they can determine some of these things. It really depends on what the bone is, if they can determine uh, gender or race or age range. Uh, it all depends on what bones they have. A forensic anthropologist will use osteology quite a bit. Osteology in general is the study of bones. So they have to look at the functions of bones in general. So they provide structure and rigidity for our bodies. If we didn't have a skeleton, we would literally be a blob just kind of rolling across the ground and picking up anything and everything on the ground as we rolled through. Uh, it protects soft tissue and organs. So our rib cage protects our lungs and our heart. Uh, they serve as an attachment site for muscles. Our quads will attach to our pelvis and our femurs and tibia and stuff like that. Uh, they produce blood cells in a process called hematopoiesis. Uh, they serve as storage area for minerals like calcium and they can detoxify the body by removing heavy metals and other foreign elements from the blood. Now, when a forensic anthropologist comes in contact with a set of bones or something that may look like a bone, they have to ask themselves a couple questions. First off, is it even bone? It could be a stone, it could be a piece of plastic, it could be anything else that looks like bone to the naked eye. If it actually is bone, is it human bone? This you have to take into account because sometimes people will bury their pets in their backyard after they pass away. Uh, or sometimes wild animals may die and their bones may be deposited in a location. So you have to determine if it is even human. Uh, if it is a human bone, what part of the skeleton is it? Is it a flat bone like in the skull? Is it a long bone like the femur? Uh, or is it um, short bones like the wrist? So if it is human, uh, and it is a skeleton and you figure out part of the skeleton it goes with, uh, how did that person die? Did they die naturally? Is it a crime scene? Or is it even a cold case that you just stumbled across? In this picture, this is every forensic anthropologist's dream. They have an entire skeleton, it's still intact, there are still some muscle attachments and skin and stuff like that. However, that is rarely the case. Uh, they usually don't find intact skeletons. Most of the time, it's just small pieces of bone or small fragments uh, in a generalized location. Uh, from the skeleton, they can tell you a lot. Uh, you can determine the sex or gender of the person, the approximate age, uh, their ancestry or their racial origins, uh, their stature or their height, and then if there's any trauma to their body. So to determine the sex of the decedent, so the person that passed away, uh, you can use the pelvis or you can use the skull. The pelvis uh, is very important with determining because it has uh, quite a few differences between male and female pelvises. The uh, three main pieces that we look at uh, are dealing with the pubic symphysis, which if you look, this is the pubic symphysis right here, okay? So the uh, pubic symphysis, so the pubic body, uh, the female will have a wider pubic body. So the female is these bones that are on top, and then the male are these bones that are down here at the bottom. So the female will have a wider pubic body. 
Uh, they have a wider subpubic angle or subpubic concavity. So this angle down here at the bottom is going to be larger in females and it'll be more acute in males. So obtuse in females, acute in males. Uh, and then the ventral arc, which is this ridge right here, uh, it's a present in some females, but not all females. Uh, and it's not present in males at all. So you may see it in a female, it may not be there, but if it is there, it is a female. So aside from those three differences within the pelvic uh, or the pubic symphysis, we have some other differences as well. So in females, the sacrum will actually be tilted posteriorly or backwards. Uh, this creates a larger pelvic outlet because when a female is pregnant, the baby will sit right here on the pelvis. And then when the baby is getting ready to be born, they have to make it out of this opening right here, okay? If the uh, sacrum is tilted forward like it is in the male down here at the bottom, that opening is very small. It will not allow a baby to pass through very easily. So the bigger the pelvic outlet is, the more likely it is going to be female. Uh, another difference is the iliac crest will be flared in a female because they have to create a cradle to carry the child for nine months. And in the male, they will be more uh, vertical, so straight up and down. Uh, if you do not have a pelvis and you only have a skull, uh, you can tell the difference between males and females based on it. Uh, males will have brow ridges in the frontal bone, so they'll have really prominent uh, eyebrow ridges, so right above your eyes, whereas females have smoother frontal bones without ridges. Uh, males will have a more square chin, and females will have a pointier chin. Males will have a more acute jaw angle, and females will have a wider, more obtuse jaw angle. Males will have a more prominent mastoid process than females, and then on the back of the skull, males will have a more pronounced occipital ridge or occipital protuberance uh, for the neck muscles to attach to more so than females. Uh, in these two pictures, you have uh, the male picture at the top left and the female picture at the bottom right. You can see the differences between the pointing of the chin versus the square chin the acute angle versus the obtuse angle of the mandible itself uh, and where the mastoid process is. So take a look at those differences. So determining age. Uh, the most accurate estimations for age are made from the teeth, uh, the epiphyses or the growth plates in the long bones, and then the cranial sutures, which are found in the skull. Uh, when investigators are estimating age, they will always use an age range because of the variation in people and how they actually age. So some people will move through an age progression faster and they'll be skeletally mature at a younger age than other uh, people. So the investigator does not want to eliminate any possibilities for identification. So they will always say, this person is you know, ages 10 to 15 or these people, the remains are for somebody that is in their 20s. So they always give an age range. So on the skull, these are the sutures that I was talking about. Uh, the sutures, uh, or the soft spots, they're called fontanelles. Uh, they are found on the skull of the infant, and then as you age, they will actually become sutures and harden. Uh, these soft spots are here to allow for easier childbirth through the canal, so through that big pelvic outlet. Uh, it will allow the brain and the skull to actually squish so that it can make it out of that opening. Makes it much easier for the mother. Uh, adult teeth versus juvenile teeth. Uh, juveniles will have way less teeth than adults do. Uh, however, all of their teeth are sitting right above and below their jawline uh, in their skull. Waiting to move into their final resting place. Uh, the epiphyses or the long bones, uh, their growth plates right here on this picture on the left, you can see that this is still an open growth plate. There's an actual gap between the two pieces of bone. Whereas in this picture, the 
gap has been closed in. This one uh, on the left is probably about 17 and the one on the right is probably in their early 20s. Uh, and as you age, those lines will actually disappear even more. So ancestry and race. Uh, this is a very difficult thing to determine because uh, most, most people are not a pure race anymore. Uh, and so it's becoming very uncommon. Uh, this is primarily used for uh, anthropological digs. So when they find a group of skeletons, they try to analyze and determine what era they came from and what uh, racial group they came from. So it's typically placed into one of three groups. So Caucasoid are your Europeans, Middle Easterns, and Indian descent, as in uh, India. Negroids are African, Aborigine, and Melanesian des descent. And then Mongoloids are Asian, Native American, and Polynesian descent. Uh, the main things that you're going to look at when determining the difference between the skulls are the orbits or the eye sockets, which are right here. The nasal aperture, which is the opening to the nose, uh, their teeth, and then the mandible itself, so the jaw. So Caucasoids will have a long, narrow nasal aperture, whereas Negroids will have a wide nasal aperture, and then Mongoloids will have a more rounded nasal aperture. Uh, Caucasoids have oval orbits, Negroids have square orbits, and then Mongoloids have rounded orbits. So you can take a look through these um, differences, and then we have some skulls on the next page for you to look at. So this one, you can see that it has a rounded nasal aperture. The Caucasoid one is more narrow up here at the top and then the Negroid skull has a wider, wider nasal aperture. So go ahead and look at the differences and see if you can identify all of the differences listed. So the estimation of height. Uh, the height of a person can be calculated by measuring the long bone, so the length of the actual long bone, and then inputting it into a, an equation. Uh, there's many different equations. So depending on your assignment, there may be an equation that's different than this one, but the equations will give you the estimated height. And that's for all of the long bones. So the femur, the tibia, the humerus, and the radius, okay? And then how you measure them. Uh, they actually have a special device because trying to measure a long bone with a ruler is very, very difficult. So they'll actually place it so that they can get the actual measurement with the curvature. So the last thing you can tell is if there was any trauma to the decedent's body. Uh, this cause of death is often determined by observing injuries to the skeletal remains. Uh, there are three categories of injuries. You can have antemortem, which is before death, perimortem, which happened during their death, which could actually be the cause of their death. And then you have postmortem, which appears after death. Antemortem injuries will have some sort of healing involved with it. So they happen some point during the person's lifetime and they will have uh, scarring. So on the skin, it looks like an actual scar. On bone, it will appear that it has been healed over in some manner. So this fracture line here with this opening, you can tell that other bone cells have started to grow on top. Perimortem injuries occur at or around the time of death and they may have caused the person's death. So you can see here that this person had some sort of blunt for tra force trauma to the back of their head. And in this picture, this is an actual picture of a skull from a person in the Renaissance and that is a sword wound in their skull. The last category is post-mortem injuries. They are any injury that will happen after death. So if it's on the skin, you will have a cut or a wound, but there will be no blood that has left that wound. Uh, on bone, it'll appear as a line like this with no other cellular healing.